Wir alle kennen vermutlich Menschen, die Recycling eine unangenehme Angelegenheit finden. Es gibt sie ja immer noch, vielleicht im erweiterten Bekannten, Verwandten, Nachbarschaftskreis, wie auch immer. Menschen, denen dieses neumodische Phänomen Recycling irgendwie suspekt ist und die es widerwillig machen oder denken, sie müssten es tun, aber eigentlich wollen sie es nicht und ähm, eigentlich damit nicht klarkommen. Keiner der Recycling-Gegner äh, spricht das offen aus natürlich ähm, und vor allen Dingen hat keiner der Recycling-Gegner dafür so gute und so überzeugende Gründe wie Mark Adams. Mark Adams kommt von der legendären Firma Witzu, die das noch legendärere Regal 606 vom aller, aller legendärsten Dieter Rams herstellt. Und in der Welt von Witzu gibt, das ist jetzt ein Zitat, in der Welt von Witzu gibt selbst, gilt selbst Recycling als Niederlage. Sagt Mark Adams, hören Sie selbst aus der erstaunlichen Welt ewiger Werte. Grüß Gott. And that is the last bad German I will subject you to this afternoon. In 1933, Henry and May Waller bought a vacuum cleaner. They paid two weeks' wages for the top-of-the-range goblin. 79 years later, their son Stanley is still using it. In 1957, my parents were married. One of their wedding presents was a Morphe Richards toaster. As a young boy, I could repair it. I knew how to take out the heating element and put in a new element. And when my parents divorced 30 years later, we were still using that toaster. A while ago at Vitsu, we needed a new toaster. And being Vitsu, we researched before we bought a toaster. We selected a toaster designed by a reputable designer, sold by a reputable retailer, manufactured, we thought, by a reputable company. It failed after 14 months. It was outside warranty. As we all know, warranty is 12 months. <laughs> Took it back to the retailer. They confirmed no repair was possible. And as it was outside warranty, it had to be thrown in the bin. You all have your own examples of this world. And frankly, we could spend the next 40 minutes talking about your examples alone. My question is, is that a society making progress? In 2004, a book called The Paradox of Choice by Barry Schwartz was published. As soon as I read the review, Mr. Speakerman, in The Economist, I went out and bought it. And it talks of us being driven bonkers by the staggering array of consumer goods from which we must choose. He goes on to explain the point at which too much choice actually becomes detrimental to our lives, to our to our psychological, to our, mo to our emotional well-being. And he points out, for example, the problem we have just in choosing a bottle of shampoo in the supermarket. It's not just choosing from 10 brands, it's now choosing from hundreds of brands and packaging that changes all of the time. And his point is that there comes a time in our life where Choice, too much choice, is becoming debilitating rather than liberating. And I can still remember the panic when I first went to that country of overwhelming choice. My first visit back in 1982. It's America, in case you hadn't guessed. <laughs> and my host, it was the first day I arrived in Miami, and my host took me out to a restaurant, and I was a young, nervous boy. And the menu arrived, and we sat down and chose some food, and, oh, yes, I'll have a green salad with it. And then the waiter says, and what dressing would you like with the green salad? And I 
as far as I was concerned, there was only ever one dressing you could have with a green salad. He refers me to the menu, and I have to look at 15 dressings on the salad to choose from. And I can just remember the panic that came over me. Oh, my God. I don't even know what these dressings are, let alone which one to choose. Barry Schwartz's book, why it was so convincing to me, is it is supported by evidence. Lots of empirical scientific evidence. We'll come to my background as a scientist in due course. He tells the lovely story I call the jam tasting story. Some of you might have heard of it before. But you go into the supermarket, there's that testing station at the side, normally a very nice lady behind it, and it has jam set out on it, and you are to taste the jams, preferably with a view to buying the jams. They did this test. One tasting station, they had five jams and asked you to taste and then see who would buy. Later, they did another test with a station with 30 jams on it. I think you probably know the result. More people bought a jam if they were presented with five jams rather than 30 jams. Schwartz's contention is that that is because there are 29 jams saying to you, why didn't you choose me? <laughs> he goes on to say that the effort as the options increase, the effort involved in making decisions increases, so mistakes hurt more. And reading this book, well, I can remember it so clearly, I suddenly realized why I had spent my entire life, my entire adult life for sure, but actually a surprising amount of my childhood, but certainly my adult life, trying to persuade more people of the merits of less choice, fewer colors, of more careful planning and consideration, frankly, of doing less better. The British environmentalist, George Monbiot, wrote, On Sunday, I visited the only UN biosphere reserve in Wales. As is usual at weekends, several hundred people had come to enjoy its beauty and tranquility. And as is usual, one or two people on jet skis were spoiling it for everyone else. Most economists will tell us that human welfare is best served by multiplying the number of jet skis. If there are two in the estuary today, there should be four by this time next year and eight by the year after. Because the estuary's beauty and tranquility don't figure in the national accounts, no one wants to pay to watch the sunset, and because the sale and use of jet skis does, this is deemed an improvement in human welfare. The World Health Organization has linked noise with stress. They've, in fact, shown that hormones are released as you sleep in response to background noise. Traffic noise alone is harming the health of almost every third European. And noise is, guess what, a direct result of economic growth. So George Monbiot concluded his article with, Beyond a certain point, hardship is caused by economic growth. The founder of The Body Shop, one of my heroines before, well, before her premature death, but certainly since her premature death, Anita Roddick. And she was the first person I heard back in the 1980s telling us that there had to be a way other than money and finances of measuring the performance of companies. It struck me at the time, it's absolutely uh, a shining light for me. There have to be other ways of measuring companies. Most people in our so-called Western societies have enough money to exist comfortably. More money allows us simply to accumulate more stuff. But we don't need more stuff. Look at what happens when you reach the pinnacle of accumulating wealth. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, and their cohort. You have to devise ways to give it away. In fact, you have to make a career out of giving it away. So why go to such lengths to accumulate it? 
often at the expense of other people. Did you know 94% of Japanese women in their 20s and 40% of the Japanese as a whole reportedly own a Louis Vuitton item? <laughs> Hence, there's not much status in owning it. So I would now just break the number one rule of talking in Germany, don't mention the war. <laughs> Can I take us back to the horrors and destruction of World War I and the flu pandemic of 1918-1919 that killed together between 40 and 50 million people worldwide? The need for cleanliness, light, fresh air, physical fitness for wiping away the past. Against that background, modernism took hold. But let us remember, it was and is a movement. It was not a style. Just think of Alva Alto's Paimio Sanatorium. I think you have a vision. But by 1933, the Bauhaus was being closed, and soon the world was at war again. Fast forward to the 1950s, Europe is once again being rebuilt, and the often overlooked Marshall Plan was in full force. The reawakening of the spirit of the Bauhaus was down there at the Hochschule of Vorgestaltung in Ulm, and the young Brown brothers were taking over the German electricals company following their father's premature death in Frankfurt they realized the potential of what was happening at Ulm. So in 1955, a 23-year-old architecture student called Dieter Rams found himself sitting across an interview table confronted by Erwin and Arthur Brown and two Ulm practitioners, often forgotten. Fritz Eichler was there representing three-dimensional design and Otto Leica was there representing graphics across the table. Not a bad quartet to be confronted by. Rams got the job as an interior designer at Brown. Nothing to do with industrial design, as an interior designer at Brown. And I still hear him today say he was very lucky to have been in the right place at the right time. As an aside, he will often give his advice to young designers today when he is in front of them. You need luck. Rams went on to head the design department from 1961 to 1995, and with his team be responsible for many of the seminal domestic electrical products of the 20th century. As I think many of you know, he's now much cited as a key influence on many of today's designers. I think the word is influence, nothing more. And for example, I was honored to uh, accompany him last August when we went to Apple's industrial design department in Cupertino. Uh, it was one of those days where I was not sure which side was more nervous, Dieter Rams or the Apple team? Uh, yet the reverence between both sides was, well, it was a special day for me, something really joyous to behold. Uh, in 1957, Rams was introduced by a fellow German, Otto Zapf, to the Dane, Niels Witsu, who was selling Danish furniture in Germany. And together, Rams, Witsu, and Zapf set out a modest vision for a way to design and make new furniture for a company that was to be called Vitsu and Zapf. And it was founded in 1959. And let me just set out that vision for you. They wanted their furniture to last longer. They wanted to avoid built-in obsolescence. They would not pander to fashion. Their furniture would be discreet and it would be adaptable. So that you as the customer could start with less Add to it, rearrange it, repair it, take it with you when you move, and most importantly, reuse it. Note that at Vitsu, we are concerned with reuse. Recycling is what you do when you fail to reuse. The result, hopefully, would be, and with the benefit of a little hindsight, might be that the customer and the company would be committed to each other for the long term. 
And based on this philosophy, the 606 Universal Shelving System, slightly cumbersome name, but we've stuck with it, was launched in 1960. And a 620 chair program, based on exactly the same mentality and thinking, and if you want me to engage you for hours on that subject alone, I'm more than happy, was launched in 1962. And today, these two products comprise Vitsu's entire business. Over the next 25 years, they evolved the designs, developed new products, and won numerous design awards around the world. And the company changed its name to Vitsu in 1969 when Otto Zapf departed. If I may, not to insult you, can I just repeat that vision and remind you it was from 1959. They wanted their furniture to last longer. They wanted to avoid built-in obsolescence. They would not pander to fashion. Their furniture would be discreet, adaptable, so that you could start with less, add to it, rearrange it, repair it, take it with you when you move, and most importantly, reuse it. Result, customer and company committed to each other for the long term. So, let me take you straight to a piece of much more recent research published by Ruth Mugg at the Faculty of Industrial Design and Engineering, Delft University of Technology in the Netherlands. She investigated the topic of product attachment, the strength of the emotional bond a customer experiences to a specific product. Quote, this definition implies that a strong relationship or tie exists between the individual on the one hand and the object on the other. If people feel strongly attached to a product, they're also more likely to handle the product with care, to repair it, and when it breaks down, postpone its replacement as long as possible. Product attachment may thus increase a product's lifetime. End quote. None of that's obscure to us at Vitsu because it's precisely what we have been doing for 50 years. And frankly, it's why, unwittingly, we have a section on our website called Love, illustrated by a wonderful heart from Wolfgang Schmidt, who used to do our graphic design in the 60s and 70s, uh, his heart from his uh, Lebenszeichen series, we thought beautifully illustrated. So why do we have a section on our website called Love? Because a few years ago, it struck us how many emails we would get, how many times we'd hear the comment orally as well from customers using the word love. Love Vitsu, love the product, love Dieter Rams, and whether it was ever directed at me, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, <laughs> but we kept seeing this word love. And so we thought, this is crazy. We have to pass all together all of the times when we are referred to, our product is referred to, our service is referred to with the term love. Recently, a customer, uh, I met with a few other customers and we sat down to have lunch as one is uh, very happy to do. And she told me a little um, story about some shelves. In 1988, we sold some shelves to uh, an architectural practice, new up-and-coming architectural practice, now I think Germany's best-known architect, David Chipperfield, uh, as he likes to call himself now a German architect, because it seems as though all of his good work is done in Germany. And I related this story to him recently when I bumped into him, actually. But the way the story goes is we sold the shelves back in 1988. They were used through a number of offices, taken from here to there, frankly, were given more than 20 years of extremely hard life. And when they were rearranging, there were a few shelves that were left over, and one of the employees at the company was offered these few leftover shelves. Would you like to take them home and stick them on your wall at home? Employee took them home and the, put them on the wall, but there were two shelves really badly damaged, really looking rather sad for themselves. And she and her husband reached the conclusion, ah, can we use them? No, maybe we should chuck them in the bin. And then they went, no, these are Vitsu shelves. We can't chuck them in the bin. So they put them on eBay. They sold these two shelves on eBay for 80 pounds, eight zero pounds. When she told me this story that afternoon, I went back to our paper filing from 1988. I found the invoice to David Chipperfield from 1988, and those two shelves were sold then for the value of 36, uh, 35 
five pounds each, 70 pounds new, back in 1988, and she just sold them for 80 pounds on eBay. <laughs> it might have escaped your notice that due to the absence of a beard and no sandals, I am a zoologist. I had my eyes opened in the 1970s by Charles Darwin, David Attenborough, and Richard Dawkins. If you've not read The Selfish Gene from 1976, I was an impressionable age. I do strongly recommend it. Long before the era of the soundbite, there was Charles Darwin's delicious short definition of evolution, descent with modification. Let's look at nature. The issue of new. Does nature hold trade exhibitions at which it announces new species, many of which will never be seen again? No. It does not strive for the newest. It strives for the best. Yet so much of our society and its media, I am loath to say, is driven by its desire for the newest, not for the best. And then there's the issue of waste. Is there any waste in nature? No. All cycles are closed. And there's a point often forgotten about evolution. If it finds something that works, it sticks with it. Most natural selection is not about change, but stasis. Extreme variants are eliminated because they are less fit than the average. Just think of the long-living shark, rhinoceros, crocodile. They work. And the story I love, you've probably all got your favorite Henry Ford stories, uh, but the particular Henry Ford story that I love is the one where the Model T had been in production for quite a long time, and a lot of them were reaching end of life, ending up in the scrapyards, and he sends out a team of inspectors to pull these cars apart in the scrapyard and find why they're failing. It comes back with this very detailed report, and part of this report that's presented to Henry Ford is that there is one component, one component in the Model T that they find that has never, ever failed. It's called the kingpin. Henry Ford's response to finding that the kingpin never broke in the Model T, reduce its specification. That is natural selection in action. There is no bone in our body stronger than it needs to be, which is why occasionally our bones break. But there's no point over-engineering every bone in every body. That is not to the long-term benefit of the human race or any other uh, race on this planet. And that's how we run Vitsu, both in terms of our business and our products. And I like to think of it as descent with modification. So talking of descent, where did Mark Adams come from? As a child, I was making carpentry. I can remember aged about six when I peeled the skin off the inside of my hand with a piece of wood and a chisel, and I pushed the chisel through the piece of wood and was amazed that it cut my hand wide open. But if you discover that at six, it helps. I was there with Lego. I was out building dens in the woods. Later, I was building sailing dinghies and then tweaking them religiously to make them go faster. How could I possibly save two seconds here and 10 seconds there and add that all up and go, well, great, I can maybe win the race by 20 seconds if I can add all of those seconds into the small improvements. Age 13, I went to one of those English schools, strange name, Aundel School, but one of the joys, one of the many joys of that school was each term we had to spend an entire week in our workshops. We didn't do any lessons at all. In the wood workshop, the die casting foundry, the sheet metal work, the, the lathes, the electronics, we had to go through each and every and learn every discipline. And I still have many of the pieces and I think some of the members of my family still have many of the pieces that I made in those days. But during that time, it was that I fell in love with biology and evolution. When I left school, in my year off, uh, I did a spell at a French university, which is why you note that I learned the wrong second language. I then returned to university in England and my zoology degree. 
And, no, just as little aside, I think you're all too old for this, but on Saturday I'm going to be speaking to a group of uh, much, much younger people. But uh, a point for me extremely relevant was around the age of 14, 15, 16, I had a group of sensible adults around me who advised me to do with my education what I enjoyed, not what I thought was going to stand me in better stead in my vocation later on. Do what you enjoy. So, as a brief spell... Oh, firstly, in coming out, therefore, of university, I had to resist that pull and lure of the City of London, of an accountancy qualification, of an MBA, all of what one was traditionally meant to do. So, after a brief spell headhunting, because they were setting, off, setting up an office in Paris, and so, like the fact that I could speak a bit of the lingo, that was in 1985, I joined an interiors shop in London's West End, uh, and I had come across this shop because I was uh, buying some pieces for my first flat, and I became quite friendly with the owner of it, and one day I walked in, about after I'd known him nine months, coming up for a year, I walked in one day and they were installing a black shelving system on the wall. And I said, oh, what's this? And he goes, oh, it's very exciting. Uh, and it's by this guy called Dieter Rams. He's head of a company called Brown. And I said, oh, Brown, oh, really? Oh, I've got uh, a Brown alarm clock. Obviously, we were in Britain, so I said a Braun alarm clock. But anyway, and I said, oh, and I've got, I've got one of those electric razors as well. And I had just selected these as being seemingly the ones most fit for the task. But I'd also become aware of his work because there was an exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum in 1982 at the then the Boiler House, which went on to become the Design Museum, where a Rams exhibition that had been in Berlin went to the Boiler House. I, okay, so, so a few things were coming together. And about a week later, the owner of that shop rang up, offered me a job. Uh, I said yes, I overhalved my salary to go and jump into that world because I thought if I don't, age 24, go and jump into that world, I will have missed it forevermore. I joined the shop three months later. The uh, owners went on honeymoon, leaving me all by myself looking after this shop in the West End. They hadn't long been out of the door, and I was getting phone calls from suppliers to that shop saying, oh, the check you have sent us has bounced. And, and then another phone call would come in. So I went through the Rolodex, found the card for, for the bank, rang them up and said, oh, we seem to have a problem here. They said, we can't talk to you. You're just the shop boy. And by the time, three weeks later, the couple returned from their honeymoon in Kenya, long before days of mobile phones, of course. We had the liquidator standing at the door and the shop was closed down. I found out how to sign on for unemployment benefit. There was all your friends and family going, well, that was bloody stupid, wasn't it? And I looked around the wreckage of this shop. We were selling all sorts of lovely products, Flos Artelucci, Marameco, Capellini, Vitra, you name it. Most of, most of the names were there. And I looked around this, and I, and I had learned a little bit in the three months there, and I thought that... The product there that seemed to have the most unrealized potential, but equally seemed a product that potentially could be controlled a little bit more, was this shelving system from Vitsu. And I had had uh, some telex communication with Niels Vitsu in Frankfurt, and on a couple of occasions I had spoken to him on the telephone. So I jumped on an airplane, I went to Frankfurt, met him, and he was in his, already in his early 70s when I first met him. A charming man, immaculate, uh, immaculately turned out, uh, a wicked dry sense of humour, a twinkle in his eye, especially if you were a woman. And he struck a chord with me right away. And I could just see across a relatively crowded room that there was something going on. Funnily enough, he was exactly the same age as my grandfather was then. And... Very shortly after that, I was introduced to Dieter Rams, who was exactly the same age as my father. A few letters were exchanged. I asked if I could set up a company to import and distribute his product in Britain. He wrote me, I still have it, the lovely letter back saying, yes, Mark, that should be nice. Let's give it a try. I went to the bank, said, can we have a £10,000 overdraft? And off we went. So over the next few years, we built a small business in Britain by targeting what I came to call the boutique architects. I've mentioned David Chipperfield already. You'll notice the date. Uh, and other opinion formers. Fast forward, March 19, 
1993, one month after Niels Witsu's 80th birthday, I got a phone call from a member of the Witsu family in Denmark, a bit of a panic, saying, just had a phone call from Dresdner Bank, and Witsu was three weeks away from being closed down, uh, and asking for my help. And to cut an extremely long story short, for the summer and autumn of 1993, I became a Geschäftsführer of and a shareholder in Witsu in Germany. My wife and I mortgaged every possession we had on the planet. And I spent the best part of the next two years working between England and Germany in what I shall officially describe as uh, difficult circumstances. And just as a little aside here, if any of you are thinking of continuing to run your business autocratically into your 80s, I strongly urge you to think otherwise. In 1995, we took the decision to close that ailing German company, lick our wounds, and rebuild from Britain. We re-engineered every component of the shelving system as we sourced new suppliers. We took every opportunity we could to improve production techniques so that we could increase quality, reduce cost, reduce delivery periods. And frankly, this process still continues to this day. Recently, about three or four weeks ago, if any of you are on our mailing list, you will have seen it, we announced a 15, 1.5% permanent reduction in the price of the cabinets that hang on our shelving system. Because we have spent nine months going around all of our suppliers saying, can we get 1% out here, 2% here? How do we re-engineer that? Can we improve the way we're doing this? Et cetera, et cetera. And once we got 15% out, we took the decision in the business. We passed every pound, cent, uh, penny, back to the customer. We passed that 15% on to the customer. We got a lot of uh, social networking activity around it, but a couple of days later, an email found its way to my inbox saying that this is the truest um, embodiment that they had seen of Dieter Rams's dictum, weniger, aber besser. In 1997, we took the shelving system, 606, as we like to call it, we took it to New York. In 2004, we opened in London's West End, and we're now today planning shelving systems interactively online with customers all around the world using software that we have developed in-house. In many ways, in fact, we now, Vitsu is a dot-com in disguise. I like to say that we're a service business that happens to make a product. We're selling in more than 50 countries, and at any one time, between 50 and 60% of the orders we are taking on any day are coming from existing customers, existing customers. Customers who started small, they added to it, they rearranged it, and they took it with them when they moved. Oh, and occasionally, well, actually, occasionally, surprisingly often, they split it up when they get divorced. It's really useful in that situation. <laughs> For example, when our customers move home or office, we will replan dismantle and reinstall their shelves. We rarely make any money from that process, but it engenders the long-term loyalty on which our business is based. The majority of our customers are in private homes and smaller offices. We tend not to go after that larger corporate object market. And in fact, they are customers who understand that lovely, lovely quote, I am not rich enough to buy cheaply. They understand that, in the long run, buying from Vitsu costs you less than cheaper alternatives. In fact, there are many people who say to me, absolutely honestly, with their hand on their heart, Mark, your business sells the cheapest shelving system. I remember exactly where I was, precisely where I was, where the sun was as well, when Niels Vitsu said to me, Mark, do you know, our happiest customers are those who have dealt with Vitsu the longest. I'm not sure how many companies can claim that. If you were to apply to Vitsu for a job, you would discover that we recruit first for character and second for skills. We drive, for example, recruitment consultants mad because we actually want to know about the person we might be interviewing. We ask you whether you bake cakes, whether you too played with Lego as a child, we'll ask you if you ride a bike. 
you will fail for sure if you ask at interview what type of car will be available for you. Or, indeed, you show any particular interest in the hierarchy and where your job title might fit into that. In short, we want to recruit fellow believers. After a lengthy recruitment process, I won't bore you with the detail here, another one I could give you an hour on, you would see the first page of an offer letter, and that offer letter explains why Vitsu is not run primarily for profit. But if we take all of the right decisions, we will make a profit. During your lengthy induction process, which now follows that lengthy recruitment process, we will point out to you we regard Vitsu as a service business that just happens to make some products. We point out that we undersell to create long-term loyalty with our customers, advising customers to resist their initial, their, um, their initial purchase, reduce their initial purchase, beg your pardon, that was the five-minute warning, noted. Um, we encourage in our company individual responsibility. We actively encourage activities outside the workplace, weavers, leather workers, dressmakers, cooks, musicians. We want them all. So, on cue, what can I leave you with? I manage a company where we want more of you to buy less of our furniture. That's a moral choice for me and everyone who works at Vitsu. Sure, we want to be a larger company because we're constantly told that more people should know about us. In fact, if I get told off most often by our customers, it's when they say, Mark, I damn well should have known about your company 10 years ago. Why didn't I know about your company 10 years ago? The installers of our shelving system, putting it up in your home, what's the comment they most frequently hear? I wish I had done this sooner. And in fact, we sell an invisible product. That's its key virtue, is its invisibility. And we sell it in a quiet way. Our customers don't like it if we sell it in a noisy way. That's not what we're here for. And frankly, on the surface, that's a recipe for madness. Invisible product sold in a quiet way. We sell directly to our customers all around the world because our, our customers hugely value dealing directly with us. That intimate communication, that sense of building a relationship, that sense that you can use this thing called the internet to build relationships, not to push relationships away, which I'm shocked by how many companies seem to use it for that purpose. The, our customers appreciate the value for money that we are bringing directly to you because we are not using wholesalers, retailers, distributors, agents, every person who sits in between the production of a product and its use in your home. So our mission is to get far more dollar, euros, and pounds for value into your hand and not lose it in the chain which must go between you and us. More people who buy from us equals fewer people taking short-term throwaway decisions. A manufacturing professor from the University of Cambridge was recently telling me about his whole system design lecture that he gives. And I casually said, oh, what examples do you use? Um, and he said, well, his first few slides are about Vitsu, because we are unusual in practicing whole system design from end to end across our business, our products, and our services, and for more than 50 years. I said, thank you. A group of MBA students from London's Imperial College Business School recently crawled all over us as part of their innovation course. And their report said that we are genuinely innovative at Vitsu, not only in our processes, but via our heavy investment in cutting edge software programming and also the constant investment in our furniture, refining and evolving manufacturing techniques, practicing dissent with modification. So, what I want to ask you is this. What does it mean for us personally? We have to resist constantly wanting more. We have to resist ever more choice, either offering it or seeking it. We must seek out the best, 
not the newest. Don't always be tempted by the new and improved. Is that just the marketing folk trying to relieve you of your money? Think more about longer-term choices. When I was married 24 years ago, I was given a dual-lit toaster. I've now repaired it three times, replacing the heating elements. It still looks great and works well. Question recycling. Aim for reuse. Too few people seem to understand the difference. Hunt down relationships. Commit to companies that will commit to you. Appreciate, even cherish, constraints. Limiting the number of possibilities might actually be liberating. And finally, you don't need to raise it, and finally, constantly consider when you might be able to do less, do it better, and most of all, make it last longer. It frames almost all of our day-to-day -day decisions at Vitsu. Niels Vitsu and Dieter Rams did not set out to save the planet more than 50 years ago with their far-sighted vision for a modern <laughs> furniture company. They were just applying common sense. But as you probably know, what Voltaire had to say about common sense, the only problem with common sense is that it is not very common. Thank you, Sean. Wenn Sie Fragen haben, liebe Konferenzteilnehmer, dann stellen Sie sie bitte jetzt und bitte stellen Sie sie jetzt in